Michael Powell's 1960 chiller Peeping Tom opens with an iconic scene of a voyeuristic cameraman stalking this eerie London street. Today, the film is considered to be one of the most important and influential movies of all time, a masterpiece of psychological terror. But when the film first opened 50 years ago, it was a very, very different story. In fact, no film in British history has caused quite such a controversy. What shocked audiences most was the way the camera's point of view made them feel like they were the voyeur, stalking a prostitute down a dingy Soho alley. The reviews for Peeping Tom were so scarily vitriolic that they drove the movie off the screen and it all but disappeared for the next two decades. Worse still, the scandal did irreparable damage to the career of director Michael Powell, who until then had been considered one of the country's best loved filmmakers. Powell had won the hearts of the nation with films like the uplifting wartime drama A Matter of Life and Death, made with his partner Emmerich Pressburger, and popular classics like The Red Shoes and Black Narcissus. But in 1959, Powell teamed up with writer Leo Marx to make something far more confrontational. Peeping Tom tells the story of cameraman turned serial killer Mark Lewis, played by Carl Boehm. Mark works in a film studio by day, but has a sideline job in CD Soho by night. Hold it. An abusive childhood has turned Mark into an introverted voyeur with a morbid fascination for the women he encounters. Using a specially adapted camera, he kills his victims whilst capturing the terror on their faces at the moment of death. Peeping Tom hit a raw nerve with its 1960 audience, tapping into fears of popular cinema and loosening morals. Within weeks, the film was pulled, and Michael Powell's career and reputation suffered. One person who knows how much this scandal affected the director is Thelma Schoonmaker, longtime editor for Martin Scorsese, and from 1984, Michael Powell's wife. Now, obviously, you know, through your relationship with him, you knew his innermost thoughts. One of the things that, that surprises me the most is reading his own account of Peeping Tom, it's not more furious. He writes about the movie and it was made and the response and then he moves on. And yet it seems to me that there must have been real heartbreak, real trauma in the way it was received. What do you know about his response to the critical? Yeah, it, it, it was interesting. As I said, I think he expected that because it was so daring there would be trouble. Uh, he didn't expect this kind of trouble. Uh, but uh, he thought the critics might have a little bit of difficulty with it. But I think that um, he accepted it in, in, he accepted that he had gone a little too far for the critics and therefore he was able to uh, incorporate that into his own life because it never made him feel uh, that he, what he was doing was wrong but he knew that he might have to pay a penalty for being that far out. The most remarkable thing I found about him living with him was that he never became bitter. Now, I think it would be very hard not to become bitter after what happened to him. He never stopped dreaming of making films, writing films, helping other people with their films uh, to the day he died. Peeping Tom may have disappeared for almost two decades, but it got a new lease of life thanks to the efforts of a famous fan. Martin, can we sit you on that chair? Is that Absolutely. all right? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Okay. Director Martin Scorsese. He got Peeping Tom into the 1979 New York Film Festival and helped fund its re-release. Now, tell me if you can how you first uh, saw Peeping Tom and the effect that it had on you. I mean, I remember really clearly the first time I saw Peeping Tom and I remember being just almost traumatized by it because it... It's a disturbing, yeah, yeah. A disturbing experience. I'd heard about the film through Jim McBride. Jim McBride, a great filmmaker who made David Holzman's Diary. Yeah. He said, I heard that, that I saw this film at the Charles Theater. It was a small theater down on 12th Street and Avenue A in, in downtown New York. And it was it's called Peeping Tom. And it's really interesting. This guy sort of makes a diary of these women. And he said uh, it was a film that uh, uh, was supposed to be distributed in America, but never was. And that was the case. And it was something that we were not allowed to see. It was almost, it was a rumor. And when I moved to Los Angeles to, 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 to make pictures, um, I was with a, um, uh, the vice president of Warner Brothers, became a friend of mine, Freddie Weintraub. And so he said he wanted to do a remake of this movie he heard about in which a, a man uh, photographs the, the victims he kills, et cetera. And it was a man named Phil Chamberlain in, in Hollywood. He had the only print in America. And it was sort of uh, almost like the Holy Grail, in a way, to see this film. And we screened it at Warner Brothers, I remember, because Freddie wanted to do a remake. And when the lights came up, we seen it for the first time, the print was kind of fading, but that was the only print, 35 millimeter. Uh, Freddie, to his credit, said, can't top that. 
and that was it. Because the talk was remaking it constantly. Sure. They heard about it. We all heard about it. We never saw it. But it's a great idea, we thought. The idea of the, the, com the compulsion of cinema, the obsession of cinema, and um, the danger, the danger of gazing. Why do you think that Peeping Tom created such a strong adverse reaction? I mean, you've seen the British reviews. People didn't just dislike it. They actively hated it. The reaction to the film is really puzzling. I think uh, it depends on the society at the time and what is allowed to be said and what is allowed to be expressed, I should say. Um, because he expressed, I think, the, really the, uh, the, uh, the danger of filmmaking and a very, very unhealthy sense of the picture, the, 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 the sense that just the, the, the feel of uh, the trashy uh, store with the, uh, and, and that incredible photographer studio, everything had a kind of very, very forbidden feel about it. They didn't want to see that on a big screen in Eastman color, which by the way, enhanced it. Yeah. The Eastman color is, is very powerful and very strong and very lurid and kind of, kind of violent in a way. If this is where you work, I can't wait to see what you work at. Mark? See, the other problem with the film at the time, probably, was that you have this serial killer, basically, horrible. Yet, he's presented um, as someone who's very, who touches you, in a way. From the very beginning, something about his eyes and his quietness, especially when he photographs those models. It's a kind of uneasy um, empathy with this person. Come on, love, don't be shy. And I think it shocked people. Um, uh, many critics uh, really, as you know, reacted violently against it because they don't, want the, they don't want those parts of themselves touched. So are the ideas of the film still as profoundly unnerving, shocking, essential as they were when it was first made? It's just that it's taken us 50 years to catch up with POW. Well, I think uh, it may not be as, um, on the surface, it may not be as shocking, uh, but the, uh, and that is visually, um, because of the nature of, uh, the, the graphic nature of the way films are made today, but that was never that way anyway. It was never a graphic film. Um, and I think um, it speaks directly now to the world we're in, um, the morbid urge to gaze. YouTube, every, every place we go, apparently there's a, a problem here about uh, uh, cameras in the streets. Surveillance cameras. Everybody, we're all being gazed upon. <laughs> so, and here we are, the, it's like an invasion of who we are as human beings. It's actually more relevant today than when it came out. Thank you very much. Thank you.